What's up, everybody? Welcome to Moxie Bets, presented by Caesar Sportsbook. I'm Katie Mox, and today we're tacking playoffs. The uh, wild card weekend is done, and now we are in the divisional round. And we've got my guy, Prop Stars, Alex Selznick from CBS Sports and from Sportsline. Prop, I'm so happy that you joined us today and are lending your expertise to the Moxie Bets listener. How listeners, how are we doing? Katie, we are doing great. It is my pleasure to be here. I'm so excited. The first time I've ever joined you on your podcast. So I'm fired up. I would also argue that this weekend is one of the very best weekends of the year in sports. Yes. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to breaking down these games with you. I agree. And it's such a wild divisional round, right? There were some pretty key upsets in the wild card round. I think a lot of people thought both the Eagles and the Cowboys would be moving forward. Didn't really think we'd see the Bucks um, this far. And the Texans um, have been such a delight and, and a fun surprise. But they've got a really tough matchup. And let's dig into this right now, right? You got the Texans at Baltimore. Baltimore laying nine and a half, nearly 10 points here. This total is 43 and a half. You know, Lamar Jackson doesn't exactly have the best track record in the playoffs. I believe he is one and four. I hear a lot of people saying this year feels different and maybe it does, but do you think that it's worth laying this nine and a half with Baltimore? Nine and a half is a lot of points, Katie, especially when we're looking at a total of 43 and a half, which is roughly yeah. average. But yeah, 10 points. It's hard to beat a, a team by 10 points, especially when the stakes are this high. Uh, yeah, so I would argue that that's a significant chunk. Uh, you know, obviously a lot of things happen in the fourth quarter when teams are playing from behind or playing catch up. So even if they are dominating the game, you know, from a yardage standpoint, uh, it's just hard to beat a team by double digits, especially this late into the season. Yeah, I stand corrected. He's one in three in the playoffs, four total touchdowns, seven turnovers. Uh, not not exactly what you want uh, going into this, certainly as a number. But look, he's won MVP before and has been bounced out of the playoffs. Um, CJ Stroud, and we talk about this on the Pick 6 podcast all the time. What a delight it has been to watch him. He doesn't have any of the, oh, he's a rookie quarterback. He's not going to be able to rise to the occasion. I'm more worried about Lamar Jackson crumbling than CJ Stroud crumbling. And you heard Lamar Jackson, too, have a conversation with the media earlier this week. He's like, he did better than I did um, in my playoff debut. H how are you looking into CJ Stroud for this matchup? I think CJ Stroud is playing as well as any rookie quarterback that I, I've seen play football, frankly. Uh, just so polished, so poised so comfortable uh, in the pocket. I mean, he just plays like he's a six or seven year uh, veteran. So that performance last week was just so thorough. Uh, yeah, just really impressive to watch him play football. That being said, uh, as someone of a, of a Texans truther and a C.J. Stroud truther, <laughs> I do think this is a tough, tough spot yeah. for him, Katie. Yeah. Uh, going on the road, he's used to playing uh, without weather inside of a dome in, in optimal conditions in Texans. Now going to be battling, you know, frigid temperatures, yeah. potentially win. In my opinion, what is one of inarguably one of the top three defense yes. in the yes. NFL. Uh, I also think without Tank Dell, even though he's just – you know, play at such a high level without him, uh, he his absence in this particular yeah. spot uh, could really show up. So I think this is just, again, a really tough spot for CJ Stroud. Is. It is. And, and I certainly, you know, look, I watched, uh, I watched that defense pick apart Brock Purdy um, and have the Niners juggernaut of an offense really struggle. Now, I think that kind of all had the makings of a trap game, but again, I'm a little bit biased here. Both of these teams pretty good at covering prop stars. Houston 10 and 8 against the spread, Baltimore 11 and 6. The under seems to be the key for both of these. It's 11 and 7 with Houston, 9 and 8 with Baltimore. Are you targeting the total in this matchup? I am, Katie. Yeah, to me, that's my favorite bet as far as the side or total is concerned. Uh, yeah, I just think for a variety of reasons. First and foremost, Baltimore hasn't played a meaningful game in three weeks. I, you really find that when teams even have one week off, uh, especially, you know, the starters resting, they just don't seem cohesive and they really are just yeah. kind of lacking a rhythm. So I just think the Ravens are very likely offensively to come out sort of sputtering. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if we see, you know, a few punts early. Uh, as far as the Texans are concerned, I think it's going to be difficult to beat Baltimore through the air. I think the Texans are also yeah. going to have a fairly conservative offense. If we've seen Baltimore's defense, uh, the one area that they've been vulnerable this season uh, has been on the ground. 
And we know Baltimore also likes to run the football quite a bit. I also think Baltimore running the football will kind of offset, you know, them kind of struggling out of the gate or kind of lacking that chemistry that I mentioned earlier. So you also factor in the weather, CJ Stroud's yeah. inexperience, uh, yeah. and the kind of the trends you mentioned as well, Katie, I think all signs do point to the under here. Well, I think you also have to think about when you look at the Texans and also the Packers, these teams barely got in the playoffs. They were playing playoff type games just to get in for several weeks now. So at some point you do think that some, you know, they're going to get a little bit gassed. Nonetheless, I'm still taking the points with the Texans nine and a half. And, and, you know, I could talk myself out of this, right? Like what I just said about what Baltimore did to the 49ers and batting down those passes from Brock Purdy, creating those turnovers and just putting him in hell. They, this defense this Baltimore defense ranks second in NFL in touchdown percentage allowed in the red zone. So they are very stingy in the red zone. But I just watched C.J. Stroud surgically cut up the Browns, who entered the postseason, the playoffs, as probably the best overall defense. And I look at Lamar Jackson and his 1-3 and three record in the playoffs. As good as he's played this year, I still can't trust him in the playoffs, just like you can't trust Dak Prescott. Look what he did just last week. Yeah. And to piggyback on your point, Katie, the Texans and Steve Stroud, they're playing with house money. They literally yes. have nothing to lose yeah. here. They're 10 point or nearly 10 point underdogs. Everyone is expecting Baltimore just to roll on them. Uh, yeah. It's kind of an ideal, optimal spot to be in where, you know, people yeah. are just expecting you to get blown out. Uh, it's yeah. hard to do in those situations. I find CJ Stroud uh, is just playing again at such a high level. Uh, he's defying all odds. Really wouldn't shock me for him to at least be competitive in this game. I agree with you. I think 10 points or nine and a half points is simply too many points. Let's go. I'm just, I just love this team and I love the vibes and I'm salty about Baltimore um, beating my 49ers and uh, having Brock Purdy have what, three interceptions, four interceptions, whatever it was. Um, okay. So let's get props on this because you are prop stars. You are the prop king. Who are you looking at? Yeah. My first prop that I like in this game, uh, Katie, is Odell Beckham Jr. over 31 and a half okay. receiving yards. Uh, we talk about the, the layoff, you know, potentially hindering the team. The one guy it's going to benefit is someone like yes. OBJ, who's at the stage of his career where he's not as, you know, youthful and explosive as he was, you know, five years ago. Uh, and he's just a, a veteran that's dealt with a wide variety of injuries. So they really kind of preserved OBJ. He was not really a full-time player the majority of the season, and that was by design. It wasn't because uh, the, the advanced right. metrics, he was playing very well when he was on the field and he was being targeted. Uh, but, yeah, he was just only playing around 50 to 60% of the snaps. The Ravens really wanted to, uh, again, you know, preserve him and have him show up and be a full-time player now that the stakes are what they are. Uh, we've seen Lamar just really improve as a downfield passer. Yeah. I think a lot of it has to do with this Todd Munkin offense. Uh, I've just... <laughs> well Anything's better than Greg Roman, but yes, Todd. Murray agreed, Thompson. agreed, Katie. <laughs> and then looking at this Texans defense, uh, which is, again, very improved. They are vulnerable down the yeah. field uh, on the perimeter boundaries as well. So I do think this is a good matchup for him on paper. I do think he's going to get a couple of shots from Lamar at only 31 and a half receiving yards. Very obtainable. So that's, that's one prop I like quite a bit. I love this. I'm tailing that, and I'm actually going to add on to it. Give me OBJ for a touchdown. This is at plus 300. The value on this, given that he is a seasoned veteran who has been in the playoffs, made big-time plays in the Super Bowl. Remember when he came in for the Rams, scored? He would have had more touchdowns in that game, I believe, if he didn't get injured. And like you said, maybe his usage hasn't been as much by design. You got Zay Flowers as a rookie coming into this game. Are you going to rely on him? Or are you going to rely on your season vet, which is OBJ? Uh, hasn't found pay dirt in three weeks, which is why I think we're getting such good value on this so i love him to go over on his yards and i think i think he got a sprinkle on on the touchdown at plus 300 i'm with you katie i think that's a great look i honestly wish i would have uh, mentioned that myself but obviously you still it's, can. It's thursday and you still can exactly <laughs> all right so what's one um other prop you're looking at maybe on the other side yeah another one and this is a tough for me because i've been backing this guy katie for the last the majority of the season including the last uh, couple of weeks here but it's i'm gonna fade nico collins at what? under. yeah I, I know it's hard to it's hard to admit but yeah i'm gonna fade nico collins under it's quite the contrarian play wow. 80 and a half receiving yards i'll tell you why for a variety of reasons a mm -hmm. i firmly believe that this baltimore pass defense is the best pass defense 
in the NFL. Uh, certainly the advanced metrics back that up. If you look at EPA allowed per dropback uh, coverage grade as well, even if Marlon Humphrey doesn't suit up. Also, uh, I think the Ravens know that Nico Collins is really the key to uh, the passing game for the Houston Texans without Tank Dell. There's just really, you know, outside of Dalton Schultz, who's not really stretching the field uh, as a tight end, uh, he's really the only guy who can really beat them on the perimeter uh, is Nico Collins, who's, you know, undoubtedly playing yeah. fantastic football. Uh, I was just seeing this Ravens defense just a couple of weeks ago in that game versus Miami, Katie, held Tyreek Hill uh, to under 76 receiving yards. So I just think a lot yeah. of attention will be paid Towards mm-hmm. Nico Collins, they recognize uh, that he is, you know, the engine of Houston's passing attack. And yeah. I just have a lot of confidence in Baltimore's pass defense. So I really yeah. think they kind of sell out to stop him and force someone else to beat him. You know, I was surprised when you first said it because you have been beating the drum for Nico Collins pretty much all season long. But your logic makes sense. And I'm kind of going by the same thing here where I'm going to take Stroud over 34 and a half pass attempts slightly juicy at minus 129 and if you look at last week he only had 21 passing attempts versus the browns but the texans were only two and a half point dogs in that game and then after those back-to-back pick sixes from flacco i mean stroud was clearly less aggressive here but this game script is different as you said they're nine and a half point dogs they're going up a they're going up against a ferocious pass defense um but the thing is is that the ravens are really stingy um on completions they're really stingy in touchdowns in the red zone but they still allow people to pass on them they allow about 37 pass attempts per game this season only the eagles actually allowed more which is just so interesting so it doesn't necessarily mean completions or points but people are still throwing the ball against them and i do do think um, that CJ Stroud is going to do that in the first matchup? He had 44 pass attempts, so um, I do like Stroud to at least attempt to uh, air the ball out in this one. I like that quite a bit. I really like, as you mentioned, Katie, taking a volume based approach as well, not having to rely on the efficiency so that if you know things aren't working for CJ Stroud, you can still bank on a high volume of attempts. I really, uh, out of all of his props, that would be my favorite as well. All right, so let's move on to my favorite game, the San Francisco 49ers taking on the Packers uh, at home. Another nine and a half point spread. We've seen this toggle between 10 um, and nine and a half. This total much higher, though, at 50 and a half. The weather in Santa Clara, it was supposed to rain. It seems like that rain is ticking off later um, in the evening, so maybe it's not going to be that bad. It seems to me that you know the 49ers have the Packers number. They are 4 and 0 in the playoffs against this team. Now, Jalen Hurts, or not Jalen Hurts, Jordan Love, excuse me, uh, new quarterback. Obviously, we've seen um, a lot of Aaron Rodgers in this time. But from a coaching perspective, Shanahan 2-0 and um, over McFloor in the playoffs just himself. And uh, I got to say, I'm just going to do what I always do here. And I'm going to take the Niners team total over 30 and a half. And the thing is, is that one, I've been doing this all season long. If you guys listen to me on any program, you know, this is my go-to bet because it just hits. And I feel like there's a lot of recency bias right now. We really haven't seen the Niners play in three weeks, right? Because even the week 18 game, they were resting some starters. It wasn't really that big of a deal. You know, a lot of backups were playing in that game. And then you just saw the Packers absolutely dismantle the Cowboys at home. But if you look at their matchup history, it's really not that surprising. The Packers have won 10 of the last 11 meetings with the Cowboys. Again, 49ers, different story. They are 0-4 in the playoffs. And when I look at this Green Bay defense, Prop Stars, they played 89 snaps against Dallas on Sunday. They could very well run out of gas, especially against a Shanahan offense that is already exhaustive. Even when people are getting on us on the first quarter, I'm like, these 49ers, they just keep wearing them down. They just keep wearing them down. And similar to the Texans, these Packers have been in like playoff scenario and games for multiple weeks. Weeks, I think it ends. I think this is going to be a bloodbath, and the 49ers are getting over 30. I am right there with you, Katie. Uh, first and foremost, I-, I love the fact that you found such a profitable betting angle uh, in the 49ers yes. team total, and you're not afraid to go back to the well. If it's not broke, don't fix it. Uh, it's been working all season long. No reason it's going to stop here. So I love the fact that you continue to go with that. But I, I'm right there with you. I'm taking the 49ers and the points here. Uh, I know all conventional wisdom or recency bias, you know, looks at how well 
Jordan loves playing, how well the Packers are playing, that big upset in Dallas. But I just think this is such a significant mismatch on paper. There's a huge talent disparity between the 49ers and the Packers. And another massive difference is, again, your 49ers are going to be up for this game. They're going to be prepared. We're not talking about a Dallas team that continually implodes in the playoffs, uh, doesn't seem to be prepared for these big game moments. Uh, No team is experienced uh, as, you know, Kyle Shanahan led 49ers team who are very motivated to, again, win the Super Bowl this year after the way last year ended for them. Uh, But yeah, I just think this is a huge letdown spot for Jordan Love and company. And credit to Jordan Love. He's had a great season. Uh, He's really shown that, you know, he could potentially be that franchise guy, but it's it's been a mixed bag. There's been some times where he has not looked good. And now he's about to face one of the best pass defenses uh, in the NFL, coupled with an excellent Excellent pass rush, one of the best pass rushes in the league. As far as Dallas is concerned, if you recall this last week on our Pick 6 podcast, I was just talking about how I thought they were one of the most fraudulent defenses in the NFL. Not the case with the 49ers at all, Katie. So uh, I really just believe they are grossly outmatched. This is a huge letdown spot. This is a huge regression spot for Jordan Love. I think the strengths of – of Green Bay's offense just do not match up well with the 49ers defense. I think the 49ers are going to, uh, yeah, roll on the Packers. Uh, and again, I like to use the term bloodbath. I think this game could <laughs> really be a bloodbath. Uh, and if there, there were a scenario where I think Green Bay even could potentially cover, it's a backdoor cover after the 49ers yeah. are up maybe 20, right. 21 points right. and then just kind of let their foot off the gas at the end of the fourth quarter. But love this spot for the 49ers to dominate this game. I love that you're with me too. I do remember you last week um, on the pick six saying that the the Dallas Cowboys defense was a bit fraudulent. And I was like, no, this offense at home has been rolling. I got the over on their team total, which was at 29 and a half, but it was all garbage time. I remember when it hit, I was like, I cannot believe that this just cashed considering the disparity of these two teams in this game. Looking at some prop bets, I feel like you have been all over Brandon Ayuk all season long. Another one that you've been beating the drum for. Are you taking a prop for him in this game? I have to, Katie. Yeah, I just think this is such a good matchup. The books continue to just really sleep and underrate Brandon Ayuk. I, I mentioned this before. Brandon Ayuk had one of the best seasons by a wide receiver in NFL history this year. From an efficiency standpoint, uh, maybe the most efficient season in NFL history, certainly of the modern era, certainly since a lot of these are metric, uh, advanced metrics like yards per route run, yards per target, uh, et cetera, open score, uh, splash zone have all existed. So Brandon Ayuk is playing at such an unbelievably high level, 1,300 receiving yards. He's had 10 targets in one game, Katie. If he was in a higher volume passing offense, uh, he would have eclipsed potentially 2,000 receiving yards for how well he's played. So I can't emphasize enough how good Brandon Ayuk is. Now we couple that with the fact that the Green Bay pass defense is absolutely mm. dismal. They rank in the bottom yeah. five in nearly every single defensive passing metric, EPA allowed per drop back, coverage grade. Uh, so yeah, this is a great matchup, a great matchup on paper. We know how aggressive Brock Purdy, who's also had a fantastic season, incredibly efficient as well, are especially while this game is going to be you know close to being competitive. So yeah, I just think Ayuk is going to continue to be the engine of the 49ers passing offense it's a great matchup on paper under 70 yards it's a no-brainer spot for me katie i love that i don't know what his longest reception is but maybe that's worth a a look to because if anyone is going to get an explosive breakaway i feel like Ayuk is the only guy that really lives outside the numbers purdy sees him he takes off and he's gone so maybe it's something that you look at as well. Uh, I'm going to look at George Kittle. He's my favorite player. I love a tight end prop. I like him over on his receiving yards, which is at 52 and a half. I also kind of like him for a touchdown. Um, Those are slimmer odds at plus 110. When you look at this Packers defense, they're ranked number 27 DVOA defending in the middle of the field, but that's where Kittle really thrives, right? We got a Uke on the outside, Kittle down the middle. It's one of my favorite things to say when he's running down the middle. Um, And you look at this, number 27 DVOA defending the middle. That's worse then the Eagles, who are at 26, the Cowboys, who are at 24, and the Seahawks, who are at 23. And we know what George Kittle has done to those teams. Packers also ranked 25th um, in yards allowed to tight ends this year. Kittle averages over this mark at about 64 receiving yards per game. That's 
11 more than this prop line. And he's gone over this prop line of 52 and a half in 63% of opportunities this season. I really like Kittle versus those safeties who struggle in man. I would also say George Kittle shows up in big games as well. Just uh, this may be some bias, but yeah, he just tends to, to show up when the team needs him as well. So I love the touchdown look and I agree. I think he's going to, uh, be running open down the middle of this Green Bay defense, which is uh, just very going to get exposed by San Francisco. So one other prop I like, Katie, as well, is I'm fading Jordan Love. We're going to go under 249 and a half passing yards. We saw him just, you know, pick apart this very overrated Dallas pass defense. Again, credit to Jordan Love. He's played phenomenal football down the stretch, but this is a whole different world he's entering here. Uh, again, and as far as I'm concerned, I really believe this inexperienced Packers team, frankly, they won their Super Bowl last week, yeah. beating Dallas in Dallas. Uh, so, yeah, they're going to play one of the league's best pass defenses, coupled with just a ferocious pass rush. He's not going to have a lot of time in the pocket. I also think not really having a viable number one option for Jordan Love is really going to uh, be working against him here. Uh, it's worked for him so far. He's really You see a different receiver, whether it's Romeo Dobbs, Wicks, uh, Christian Watson, who's been banged up. Uh, a different guy sort of steps up Jaden Reed every week. But against the 49ers, I think they need a bona fide number one guy, which they're really lacking right now. I think yeah. the, the 49ers uh, coverage unit is extremely underrated for as great as that defense is as well. Again, I think they smother and completely shut down, or maybe not completely, but I really think we see a drastic difference uh, between how Jordan Love has looked you know, maybe past six, seven, eight weeks compared to how they look against the 49ers. They really make life difficult on him. So I love fading yes. him under 250 passing yards. I love that. And like you said, Green Bay has already won. One, they made the playoffs yeah. um, the first year removed from Aaron Rodgers. And then they go in and they win their first playoff game on the road in Dallas. And they're playing with house money right now. And everyone always says, oh, a, t a team that has nothing to lose is scary. The team that has everything to lose is also scary. And if the 49ers somehow don't show up in this game, which, by the way, in the last six appearances in the playoffs they have made the nfc championship game in every single one of them the niners get in the playoffs they usually make it to the nfc championship game now we have lost the last two in a row third time is the charm <laughs> i hope um but i'm just capitalizing on on this um uh, ferociousness of the 49ers how well rested this defense is we've got eric armstead back which by the way the numbers with armstead versus without armstead are like night and day everybody's going to be healthy who, it doesn't matter who wins the coin toss in this one. The 49ers are scoring first, and that is at plus 112. And actually, shop around for this line because I've seen it as high as plus 160. They have scored first in eight of their last nine home games. So this, and again, they're coming out, they're getting a three and out if it's Jordan Love. Um, or, and look, not to take anything away from Jordan Love. He had an incredible opening drive versus um, versus the Cowboys, but that's not happening this week. So give me the 49ers to score First, we are going to take a quick break here when we come back. More of the NFL divisional rounds with my guy, Prop Stars. You're watching Moxie Bets. We'll be right back. Why should you bet with Caesars Sportsbook? Two words, Caesars Rewards. Every bet brings you closer to the type of benefits only Caesars can offer. Hotel stays, VIP experiences, sports and concert tickets, and more. It's not just an app, it's an empire. Welcome back to Moxie Bets, presented by Caesar Sportsbook, here with Alex Selznick, a.k.a. Prop Stars, previewing the Divisional Round Weekend. All right, now we are moving on to an interesting matchup, one that I didn't foresee happening, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers at the Detroit Lions. This line is six and a half, under a touchdown, um, total pretty low for a Detroit Lions home game, as far as I'm concerned, at 48 and a half. Uh, Jared Goff versus Baker Mayfield, two of five quarterbacks drafted in the first overall. And to be honest, I think they're the two weakest quarterbacks in the entire uh, divisional round of the playoffs. What are you thinking with this one? We saw the Detroit Lions all of a sudden have a pretty good red zone defense holding the Rams and, um, and Stafford away from scoring. And that was really the difference in that last game. But 
can they keep it up? Was that a fluke or is that is that the new team? Uh, I think it's somewhere in between, Katie. I think, uh, you know, uh, against this Tampa Bay Buccaneers team that I would uh, argue is the worst team remaining in the playoffs. I would have said that yes. last week. They had the good fortune of running into a team that had quit uh, potentially on their head coach and didn't show up, but just not impressed with this Buccaneers team. I really don't think they can take advantage of some of the, you know, uh, weaknesses of this Detroit Lions team. But I ultimately think, you know, Detroit at home, uh, Dan Campbell coached football team. They kind of know what their strengths are. They know their weaknesses. Uh, they know what to do with Jared Goff. Do they keep him in a clean pocket? Uh, they don't yeah. let pressure really get to him. I don't think the Bucks have the ability to really disrupt Jared Goff either. Uh, the Bucks also have such a vulnerable pass defense down the middle of the field on the perimeter as well. So I just think this Lions team, they kind of know yeah. what their strengths are. They don't hide from them. They're a good football team. They're well coached. They don't make mistakes either. Defensively, they play pretty sound. I know the pass defense isn't very good, but they're a good run defense. They kind of force teams to be one dimensional here. Uh, I like the Lions in this spot. I just think the Bucks are just not a good football team. They shouldn't have made the playoffs. Uh, I mean, they're here. Anything can happen, but if the Lions team that's been fairly consistent uh, that we've watched pretty much all season outside of a few duds, not really, though. Dan Campbell's had the team uh, pretty much yeah. up for almost every game. Uh, I think that Lions team rolls. I like them to actually cover by six and a half here. I, I with you and co-sign on everything. I will say these teams against the spread this season are tied, both at 12 and 6. Baker Mayfield is 3-0 and against the spread in his career in the playoffs, but Homie's been in the league for a very long time. And the fact that he's only been here for three games probably tells you everything uh, that you need to know about this. And I agree with you and this Bucks team. Yes, they beat the Eagles, but anybody watching that game could see that the Eagles were, unfortunately, just very dysfunctional. There was a lot of individual football going on with missed tackles and Jalen Hurts making those business decisions. That just that was not the Eagles team that we have seen. And, and you know, you're an Eagles fan. And it was very surprising to see a lot of that stuff happen. And just real quick, actually, before – I mean, I'm co-signing. I'm also – I'm Lions minus six and a half here. Um, but on the Pick 6 podcast, you had said, if they lose this game, that Nick Sirianni – could be fired. Do you still believe that? And then also you had said multiple times that he lost the locker room. That team was the most uncohesive thing I have seen in a very long time. One year removed from being this ridiculous unit that could get you on either side of the field. I would agree that he's lost this locker room. Yeah, it's really an inexplicable uh, downfall for the Philadelphia Eagles. You mentioned last year they had a great season, obviously coming up short in the Super Bowl. They retool in the offseason, just add a plethora of talent on both sides of the football, Katie. Expectations sky high as well. Uh, and then come into the season starting off 10-1 and one, and then just have just the ultimate, the collapse of collapses, get – a miracle first round draw after limping into the playoffs against a Tampa Bay Buccaneers team uh, that is, you know, anyone would argue is the least talented team in the playoffs and then just get absolutely smoked. You could just tell by the first drive that the Eagles weren't going to be competitive in that game. So uh, yeah, I think the e I think it's a tough decision for Jeffrey Lurie. Obviously, Nick Sirianni has had success as the head coach, taking them to the Super Bowl last year. Uh, they did obviously finish, you know, 11 and six this year and did make the playoffs. Uh, but I do think the locker room has been splintered. You know, they have a lot of veteran players that have been in the league a lot of time that are well respected. As yeah. a result of that, I don't think, you know, if it was a younger locker room or less experienced locker room, it would have gotten out to the press. You know, that yeah. guys were really unhappy. Right. We've heard about A.J. Brown, but beyond that, you know, that that's really the only guy that we've heard through the media yeah. that's, you know, had been at odds with Nick Sirianni. But I really think the locker room is splintered. I know that Nick Sirianni went to owner Jeffrey Lurie yesterday, uh, presented, you know, I guess uh, how he's going to retool the coaching staff. Uh, I think it's a tough decision for Jeffrey Lurie. But ultimately, I think if you kind of weigh the temperature of the locker mm -hmm. room, you just have too many guys who are probably too experienced and worth too much to the Eagles uh, who I don't think are willing to coexist with Nick Sirianni. So I do believe he ultimately gets fired here. Well, and you know what? 
if you are going to fire your coach who has been so good to you in terms of, you know, making the playoffs, winning records, everything that he's done, uh, making a Super Bowl, but there are some damn good coaches right now. If there's a year where you're like, do we walk away from this and get a Bill Belichick or a Harbaugh or, you know, like maybe this is the year that you do that. So it's an, it's interesting. Katie, that is such a good point because I think, you know, fans sometimes, myself included, can be short-sighted. You know, things go wrong and it's easy to be like, oh, let's, you know, fire the coach. Like that's just like an automatic fix. You know, it's only really makes sense in my opinion if there is right. a clear cut upgrade out there. And as yeah. you mentioned, Katie, this might be the richest class of yeah. coaches uh, that we've seen potentially available. So if there was a time to do it, I couldn't agree more. It would be right now with the amount of, you know, credible, viable options uh, on the market. So many. And uh, Bill Belichick would be actually very, very interesting. All right. So let's get back to this Lions um, and Bucks game. I have an interesting prop. It's a, it's a it's a game prop, if you will. I'm taking the over nine and a half points in the third quarter. And when I started looking deeper into these stats with the Lions, the Lions have a real problem coming out of the of the second half and into the third quarter. They turn the ball over at an alarming rate. They've got 23 turnovers total this season. Eight of those have come from the third quarter. They also allow the sixth most yards and the second most touchdowns in the league in the third quarter. And the over in the third quarter total has cashed in nine of Detroit's last 10 games. That's a 65% ROI. Now, their offense doesn't necessarily struggle. They're averaging 5.7 points in the third quarter. We only nine and a half and this defense defense doesn't show up outside of the second half. I love this. I like this too, Kay. This is obviously not a bet I would have thought to take, uh, but just from an <laughs> observational standpoint, I've personally watched this Detroit Lions team build up so many leads in the first half, and then we know their pass defense uh, is not good no matter how you cut it, whether they're playing with a lead or playing from behind. Uh, but yeah, especially when they're, they're nursing a lead, they kind of tend to take the foot off the gas proverbially and uh, kind of play a lot of prevent and just allow teams to rack up a ton of yards. So I could really see a scenario unfolding, you know, where they rack up a, a 21 point, um, maybe 21 to 3, 21 to 7, 21 to 10 first half lead. And then we kind of see Baker uh, pick up a lot of yards or, mm -hmm. you know, potentially get mm -hmm. the game closer in the third quarter. So I like that angle quite a bit. What are you looking at for props? Yeah, so this prop that I have here, Katie, is probably my favorite prop, or at least one of my favorite props on the board right now. It's Sam Laporta over, I have it written down here, 34 and a half. I think the actual recent number is 36 and a half. Obviously, I'm comfortable with both numbers, but I was really encouraged with Sam Laporta yes. uh, last week. Wasn't thought to play, right? Had the, had the mm -hmm. obviously, the serious injury, did not look good, uh, kind of made the miraculous turnaround. He ended up catching a touchdown pass, only three receptions for 15 yards. But what was really significant to me, Katie, is he played 80% of the snaps. He was yeah. in there on run plays as well. That tells me he is playing and feeling pretty well. And then an excellent indicator to me is he practiced in full yesterday, their first day of practice. So I expect a full-time role for Sam Laporta, who has mentioned he feels significantly better than he did this yeah. point last week where he was obviously good enough to suit up. He's just been a phenomenal season. One of the best seasons by a rookie tight end in NFL history, Katie. And then the Bucks. The Bucks have surrendered the third most yards to opposing tight ends. Yeah. As I mentioned previously, very vulnerable over the middle of the field as well. And on top of that, we get a significant discount on his line because the sports books and the odds makers still feel like he's not 100%. Normally, this line is in the high 40s or yeah. potentially even high, low 50s if it was a playoff game. Uh, so I love this spot, catching a big discount on Sam Laporta in what is a great matchup with nearly a 50-point total in optimal conditions inside of a dome. I love this. And I'm, I'm thinking now from a DFS perspective too, is Sam Laporta someone that you're putting in the lineups? Because maybe he's going to be a little bit less owned. I mean, if the books are thinking that, you got to think a majority of fantasy players are also kind of thinking that. So he could be a, uh, not sneaky because Sam Laporta, as you said, is one of the best tight ends in the league. But maybe a lot of people are going to be, you know, looking the other way. Um, certainly with the uh, it's not AJ Brown. He's who's their um, Amonra St. Brown, Amonra St. Brown going that way. And sneaky as far as the slate is concerned, right? Because like, you know, everyone yeah. who's available at this point is, you know, somewhat of a no notable player with only the amount of games that we have. Uh, but I agree. He would make a great value uh, as far as DFS is concerned. Katie, do you want my other prop 
from this I game. Sure okay, I so sure I'm going to fade Rashad White running what? back for Tampa Bay. I know he's played well recently. Another one that you've been beating the drum for. Beating the drum for, but it's been more of I, I've kind of – I was fading him a lot early in the season. Yeah. And as the season progressed, I was really impressed uh, with yeah. how he was playing. Uh, but, yeah, I, I think as a I'm, – I'm choosing to fade him as strictly a running back under 55 yeah. and a half rushing yards. Yeah. His real skill set, Katie, is, is as a three-down player and it's his ability to catch passes out of the backfield. I just think we're going to see negative game script for Tampa Bay. I don't think he's yeah. going to get that, you know, necessarily the volume. He had 18 carries last week, and that was a game where they blew out Philly basically uh, from the beginning of the game until the end. Uh, so, yeah, I just don't necessarily see him getting upwards of 15 carries in this game. And then the strength of this Lions defense is definitely yeah. their run defense. Defense. Uh, obviously, yeah. these teams hooked up. I forget what week it was with the Lions winning twenty to six. Uh, I believe they held uh, they held uh, Rashad White to under forty yards rushing in that game. Uh, so yeah, I just think it's going to be a tough spot. I think he's going to be working against uh, game script. I think he'll his real utilization is going to be through the short area passing game as well. So I'm going to fade him under fifty five and a half rushing yards. I like that. Mine kind of goes hand in hand with that. I am going to take Baker Mayfield over one and a half passing touchdowns. Is at minus 106. Now, again, I think the Lions cover this game easily by the touchdown. But the one thing we've seen with the Lions is they get themselves into shootouts every single weekend. And like you said, they don't really, uh, the Bucks at least, don't really have a run game outside of Rashad White, who you're fading and don't think gets, you know, too much yardage in this game. And they're so good against the run that you basically just have to pass against them. Baker Mayfield has had at least two passing touchdowns in nine of his last uh, 12 games. That's a 68% ROI um, if you were betting that over that time. And even though we saw them keep Matt Stafford out of the end zone, that was also their first playoff game since 1991. It was against Matt Stafford. Not that they're not going to step up in this game, but like you can't have, uh, excuse my French here, pass defense the entire second half of the season and then you have one good game and now I think you're going to shut everybody down that's just not the way I'm playing this so I do think that Baker gets at least two I love it Katie yeah I think Detroit obviously they've been a significant pass funnel all along uh, all season long you know both of us back in Detroit as well could really see a scenario where like a lot of Detroit games they're up 21-3 21-7 as I mentioned in the first half yeah and then just kind of take the foot off the gas and we see Baker throw a couple touchdowns. So yeah, even uh, that's something I'd actually look potentially as a live line uh, in yeah. the event that we see uh, Detroit, you know, get off to a big, a good start, rack up a big lead in the first half. Cause you know, Baker's just going to be throwing the ball quite a bit in the second half and Detroit will just back up and kind of allow him to. Yeah. And hopefully those both come in the third quarter and then we hit the, <laughs> hit the over on that one. All right, Sunday evening. This is probably the one that everybody is looking forward to. It's the classic matchup, right? I don't think a lot of people thought it was going to be Bucks and Lions and, you know, Niners and Packers, but this one, Chiefs and Bills, is one I think a lot of people have had circled on their calendar, uh, hopefully, um, all season long. You got the Chiefs as two and a half point underdogs. That's at even money. This total 45 and a half. Game, obviously, in Buffalo. They both had uh, different kind of freezing games. Obviously, the Kansas City game was a lot more cold, the coldest game in NFL history, but Buffalo had to move their game um, in order to to play because the storm was so bad. It's the seventh meeting between Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen. The series is tied three and three. Um, obviously, the last time they met in the divisional round, or was that the, I think it was divisional round. It might have been the, uh, oh, it was a conference championship game, actually. KC won 42 to 36 in overtime. Um, we now have new overtime rules after that game. You and I are on different sides of this one. Um, tell me why you like Kansas City. Uh, first and foremost, I want to preface, Katie, I, this is out of all the sides and totals that I've picked, uh, I have the least confidence probably in this one. Same. I really Same. seesaw back and forth. I was. I think I even went on the, the show rundown uh, when we added our picks, Katie. I might have even typed in Buffalo and then deleted it later for Kansas City. Uh, but ultimately, I just think if it comes down to, for me, Getting points with Patrick Mahomes, uh, I'm going to bite here. Then when I couple that with the fact that I'm just looking at Buffalo's injury report, they are so banged up as yeah. well. And then just watching Kansas City, I know it's just been a real struggle all season long, but uh, I just saw something with Rishi Rice really yeah. uh, becoming that kind of number one viable 
wide receiver uh, who Patrick Mahomes can now count on. Takes a lot of pressure off of Travis Kelsey as well. We have Isaiah Pacheco. He's playing great football. More on that in a second here. Uh, but, yeah, I've seen Andy Reid really commit to the run more so than I have, really, because, frankly, it's been uh, the most successful aspect of Kansas City's offense has been their mm -hmm. ground attack. You don't expect to see that in a Patrick Mahomes-led offense, but they're really running the ball very effectively. Buffalo, interestingly, they give up between the tackles up the middle of the field 4.6 yards per carry. That is 29th out of 30th in the NFL. And we've seen, again, just the Chiefs really commit to running the ball uh, traditionally uh, with yeah. Isaiah Pacheco. So I just think we see uh, the Kansas City run the ball effectively. I think we see a really balanced approach. I've also, I think, I think Kansas City's defense might be the best unit oh, yeah. In this game, if we look at all four, uh, they're playing very good football. Uh, and we've just seen Josh uh, Josh Allen, who is also playing well, just kind of struggle against a defense uh, that ranks, you know, pretty much top five in every single defensive passing metric, which Kansas City does right now. Uh, so I think the game is going to be really competitive. I think it yeah. comes down ultimately to a field goal. But for me right now, if you're going to lay a few points with Patrick yeah. Mahomes, I just feel a little bit more yeah. confidence just it's the slightest margin i might change my mind two or three times right now right. Uh, by kick off katie <laughs> but if it were right now gun to my head uh, i'm gonna take the points with the chiefs yeah i'm with you on this one i've gone back and i could convince myself on either side of this um but i'm just gonna i'm just gonna lay myself in front of the train here and and lay the two and a half with the bills um because the Chiefs have just bullied the Bills in the postseason for so many years now that like something's got to give, right? And we saw Buffalo struggle kind of in the first half of the season. They're peaking at the right time, which is kind of different than before they were peaking in the beginning part of the season, and then they would drop off. And so I feel like their confidence is, is building. And not only is this Mahomes' first road playoff game prop, but this is his first time facing Bills Mafia. The only other road game that he has played in Buffalo was in 2020 when there was no fans. So I do feel like it's going to be, a, he's never been to like the true Orchard Park with those fans, those crazy fans. And that's, Look, Kansas City definitely is probably the hardest place to play for opposing teams, but don't knock um, Orchard Park either. And they're going to be hungry and ready for this one and just want the revenge for the last couple years. Um, in the last 10 games, the Bills have a straight-up record of seven wins, three losses, an active win streak of six in a row. Um, I'm just going to go with the momentum on this one. And like I've said, well, I just can't quit. Josh Allen. I just can't quit him. I wish that I could. He's lost me a lot of money. <laughs> He's like my Jimmy Garoppolo. He's my new Jimmy Garoppolo um, is what Josh Allen is. So I'm going to do that. But but on on that note, I've got a, I've got a Josh Allen parlay that I think everybody should play. A Josh Allen rushing touchdown, anytime touchdown, and a Josh Allen interception. Those are two automatic things. 15 rushing touchdowns this year, 18 interceptions. Parlay those together. We're getting plus 333. Book it, people. That's cashing. I love that look, Katie. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's a lock. You know he's going to make uh, at least a couple turnover-worthy plays. Oh. We've seen the Chiefs really capitalize. And, uh, yeah, he runs in the playoffs, and he is by far their most effective, uh, you know, goal line runner. Oh, by the way, they cut Leonard Fournette as well. So yeah. uh, love that look by you, Katie. I think that's really sharp. I will be tailing that bet myself. Uh, one of my favorite prop bets of the week, Katie, is Isaiah Pacheco. I mentioned him as I was saying why I'm backing the Chiefs here. I like him to go over 61 and a half rushing yards. The Bills' yeah. defense is really kind of uh, – they've been inconsistent, but uh, just uh, they've been very vulnerable – up the middle again, 4.6 yards of between the tackles allowed per carry to opposing running backs. That's 29th out of 30 teams uh, in the league this year. So they have certainly been vulnerable, and I think the Chiefs are going to take advantage of that. We saw Isaiah Pacheco last week with 24 rushing attempts. Uh, this is not Andy Reid uh, for the longest time was really afraid, or not necessarily afraid, but unwilling to kind of pound the rock and really. Uh, utilize one running back in particular. Uh, he has a lot of tre a tremendous amount of confidence in Isaiah Pacheco, and he is willing to uh, give him big workloads, which I think we see yeah. uh, this week against Buffalo. So, yeah, I like Isaiah Pacheco to be the focal point of Kansas City's uh, offensive game plan. It's no longer, you know, coming out here. Both offenses uh, are yeah. a lot more conservative than what we're expecting. So I think we see a lot of rushing in this game, and I think Pacheco has a big game on the ground.
I mean, we've seen this run offense just completely change from when they were trying to do it by committee with uh, Clyde Edwards-Alaire and McKinnon versus when Pacheco is in. And we were talking about in the beginning part of this season, too, Pacheco's season yards were priced ridiculously low, considering that he was very clearly going to be the number one back. Now, of course, he dealt with some injuries this year, but I agree with you. I love this over. But you are fading Stefan Diggs here. Katie, yeah. And, uh, you know, as reliable as the 40. Niners team total has been throughout <laughs> the season. Okay. Katie, right. since they have made the, ch- uh, the change uh, to Joe Brady as their offensive yeah. play caller, since they fired Ken Dorsey, I believe it was eight weeks ago, and implemented Joe Brady as their offensive play caller, Stephon Diggs has had a 75-yard game one time. He has been a complete afterthought in the offense. Even last week where he received double-digit carries, it only resulted, in, I, th- I believe, 55 receiving yards and that was probably his best game uh that he's had over the second court second half of the season so uh there could be a number of things at play here Stephon Diggs could be operating at less than 100 percent uh the offense has become way more or conservative he just whines and cries too much he's, and they're like bro we don't need you he's unhappy as well he's disgruntled and then on top of that you have a chief's path defense that's yeah. excellent yeah. and they're very good at taking away the opposing number one. Oh, and there's no Gabe Davis to worry about on the back end mm-hmm. as well. So Diggs is going to receive a lot of attention uh, from this very vaunted Kansas City pass defense. He has to prove to me uh, that he can eclipse 65 yards. Uh, he's an automatic fade, especially in a tough matchup. So I like this one quite a bit as well. I love that. I was looking at Patrick Mahomes' props, and I kind of just just like betting this game, you know, on the spread. I kind of like didn't know where to go with Mahomes, but then I started thinking about because they've had so many drops and so many crazy things happening in their receivers. We've seen Mahomes scrambling more than he has in his career. Four hundred and thirteen yards in the regular season. Now he averages about twenty four per game, which is under his rush yards prop, which is at twenty eight and a half. But he scrambled for forty one yards last week versus Miami. Again, his first time at Orchard Park. This Buffalo's defense is going to be playing up. They do have a mean pass rush. Maybe, you know, I just think he's going to be using his legs more. I wouldn't be surprised if we see him scrambling. So I I do like him to get at least 29 uh, yards with his legs. Uh, I like it, especially these high leverage situations, Katie. Uh, In my opinion, you you kind of save your legs for these spots. Quarterbacks just tend to rely more on their legs in the playoffs. They're not, you know, Mm -hmm. the, the, the stakes are so high that they're kind of willing to take the risk that comes with escaping the pocket and, you know, the impact they potentially uh, will face. So I like that quite a bit as well. All right. Well, prop stars, the time has come for Mox Locks. This is the one thing you are absolutely taken to the window. What do you got? Uh, I, whew, this is such a tough one for me, Katie. If I had, no. to, if I had to take one bet. Is it Laporta? Is it Jordan Love? Uh, it's going to be Jordan Love. I'm going to go Jordan Love on 250 passing yards again. The San Francisco pass defense uh, is being slept on in such a letdown spot, in my opinion. I just don't think Green Bay has the perimeter outside options to really threaten uh, San Francisco, who are going to be very physical with these wide receivers, who, again, I believe they're playing well, but just they're they're just due for some natural regression here. So I'm going to fade, I'm going to, excuse me, fade Jordan Love under 250 passing yards. I love it. And and you already know where I'm going with this. Give me the Niners team total over 30 and a half. We are riding this until the wheels fall off. Uh, I don't need to go into why I'm taking it. Y'all know. Y'all know the deal. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us today, Alex. Obviously, you're everywhere. You're on CBS Sports HQ. You're on Sportsline. You're on the Pick 6 podcast um, on CBS. You're also on the Early Edge. You can find Alex on social at PropStars. Now, there's a Z in the the last of his name. But um, talk to me about what you got going on this week. Anything that we should specifically tune in for? Yeah, Katie. I've got a couple of articles coming out today, actually Thursday. Uh, very much looking forward to breaking down every game, sort of what we did there, just recapping my favorite props. I'm also doing a lot of NBA content uh, at this stage of the season as well. Every Monday Love and it. Thursday, I have NBA Best Bets. So, uh, yeah, you can just find me all over those places you mentioned. And uh, thank you so much for having me on here, Katie. Oh, thank you. And I will say Prop Stars is great in the NFL, but his NBA props are money people. So make sure that you uh, follow him over at Sportsline and CBSSports.com. Thank you so much. This has been Moxie Bets presented by Caesar Sportsbook. Don't forget to follow us on social as well at Moxie Bets. And we'll see you next time. Go Niners. 